Yeah, no, I'm fine. I just like to look at Welcome. Thank you for being here. I'm Jeremy Druin, uh, manager of the library's Missouri Valley Special Collections. Uh, our research room is uh, located right across the hall from this auditorium. 805 days. That's how long it's been since we've hosted a program uh, inside, in person inside this auditorium. 805 days, more than two years. So let me officially uh, welcome you back. Uh, in person for our Sunday programs. And I also want to welcome all of those who are joining us uh, live on our YouTube channel. I believe it was June of last year uh, when Dr. Fred Woods was, our, or Dr. Fred Woods, our speaker this afternoon, uh, was researching, uh, was in town to research in the Missouri Valley Room. And he, we discussed, he mentioned he was coming back in April and we discussed a, a program. And I believe he said, do you, you know, do you think you'll be doing in-person programs again? And I, I, oh, certainly, you know, surely by the end of the year, we'll, we'll be back to in-person programs. Little did we know that this would be our first one here, here in April. Um, it's my pleasure to, to welcome Dr. Woods uh, back to the library and to, to give a, pr a presentation on Mormon Transmigration in Missouri between 1838 and 1868. These decades were an overlooked period of LDS in Missouri <clears throat> history when Latter-day Saints traversed hundreds of miles across, across the state despite a government extermination uh, threat issued by the governor. Woods has been a professor of church history and doctrine at Brigham Young U University since 1998 he specializes in Latter-day Saint immigration studies and is the editor of Saints by the Sea, uh, Saints by the Sea website, which documents LDS maritime immigration in America in the 19th and early 20th centuries. He is editor and compiler of the Mormon Immigration Index, which was released in 2000 and is widely used by researchers. Woods has authored and co-authored more than a dozen books and scores of articles on LDS history and has collaborate, collaborated on uh, several documentary films, the most recent being The Saints of Tonga, A Century of Island Faith, which is a companion work to his 2019 book. He has le lectured extensively at conferences, universities, churches, and libraries, and we are thrilled to have him back at, here in Kansas City at the Central Library. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Fred Woods. Thanks, John. <clears throat> well, good afternoon, and uh, thank you, Jeremy, for your kind introduction. I also appreciate on this Sunday afternoon we have Joel uh, Jones, the assistant director of the library, and uh, appreciate him uh, being here. Appreciate all the help that I've had with uh, the technology. I hope things are. Uh, working well. Does it sound like things are up? Okay. 
So even though there's only a few here, there's, I'm told, at least 10,000 listening in right now. <laughs> so, <clears throat> well, I hope you have a good time today. I want to have a good time. I think history should be enjoyable, even when you, you deal with some things that, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? So, I, for me, I like to generate light instead of heat. I will tell you right up front that I'm not six, uh, six generation Mormon heritage. I'm a guy that's street wise from LA that tied into the Latter-day Saints as an adult. And uh, so I think it might be helpful for the audience, those of varied uh, faiths and cultures, because I've looked at this topic and many others from the outside looking in and now from the inside looking out, if that makes sense. So I'm gonna kind of just take you on a tour some, uh, of some things. I'm going to talk about this topic for about 45, 50 minutes and then open it up for questions. I want, want you to give, have that opportunity, but if you can wait till I'm finished and I say, okay, Q&A time, that would be nice. So let's just kind of uh, get into this. I wanted to thank BYU uh, for their support of all my projects. And by the way, I love the uh, Missouri Valley Room right over here. If you've never been in it, you've got you've to pop in on your way out. And uh, most recently, I was looking to have 532 sources only to be used in the Missouri Valley Room on, if you uh, search the word Mormon, if you're looking under Latter-day Saints, there's 459 sources only to be used. So they have a very rich collection of Latter-day Saint uh, sources here. So with that, <clears throat> I want to go back to uh, 1833. Now, what you need to understand, and so this is like we're talking history, right? It's like, I, you know, you have this them and us, but hopefully by the time that you, we finish this, it's like we, right? We go from conflict to understanding and things uh, work out. But I wanted you to say before even laying this thing out that I was thinking this morning of a 1828 Protestant missionary journal I read uh, a guy's coming from New England. He's being sponsored. He gets to Jackson County right on the, the border, right? You have the unorganized territory once you cross the river. And he's saying that this area at that time, certainly not now, was the most godless place he had ever seen. I mean, this was on the Santa Fe Trail. This makes, uh, you know, gun smoke look like um, kitty cartoons, okay? It was a wild place. And, um, you know, you read that in, in his account, there was a, a multiplication of the women practicing the world's oldest profession. There was a lot of whiskey. It was crazy. It was wild. There was cockfighting and, and uh, people trying to um, take each other out from time to time. And when the federal marshals would come into Erie, he said, there was a scurrying across the border, Right. Kind of like if you're a drug runner in San Diego and you're going to Tijuana, something like that. But this is how it was in the 1830s. It was rough and tumble. Now we have some great uh, upstanding citizens and things have changed. But it was, I mean, mixing Latter-day Saint culture with what was then at the time was like oil and water. It just wasn't gelling at all. Okay. So I want to just point that out as we get into this. And there was this, they call it the mob manifesto in history where the Missourians at the time were making their point of why they wanted Latter-day Saints to leave, okay? They were tampering with the slaves, or they were Northerners, and you had a lot of people, of course, that were uh, Southerners coming in on the Missouri side, accused of being friendly to Native Americans in Indian territory, right? We had missionaries that were sent over there, and uh, they were worried, you're going, okay, you're going to get the uh, slaves to revolt, you're going to get the Native Americans, and you're going to come after us, and... There was economic and political competition as well. So this, these, were, these were issues. I mean, when the Latter-day Saints were all vote, voting for one person, kind of block voting, this was a problem when you have like 3,500 people in the community, and all of a sudden you've got a herd of these Mormons coming in, you know, to the tune of 1,200. So we've got to understand, I, I, I mean, I can really see the other side of the issue and uh, so we have these land policies, you know. Uh, how would you feel if someone said to you, well, you can either sell us your land or we're going to take it from you, right? This kind of an attitude. It was, so we could have done better as Latter-day Saints. We could have generated light instead of heat 
on a number of days, weeks, and even years. So there's two sides of the story, and uh, I'm hoping by the time I get through this, you'll, you can see this. So some of the factors I can see, so this is what the mob manifesto, this is what they laid out like July of 1833. You need to leave because of this. This just is not working, okay? So this idea of Latter-day Saints boasted of taking Missouri lands or were going to take, they were gathering in haste. They were told, don't gather in haste, but be consistent with the feelings of the, of the people. Don't over try to overpower them, okay? And some of the things they were doing wrong, uh, there were jarrings, contentions, envy and strife. They'll say lustful and covetous uh, desires in their um, Latter-day Saint scriptures. So this is kind of laying out the big picture. And um, anyway, as a result of this, by 1833, Latter-day Saints are cast out of Jackson County. But that isn't the really, uh, that's kid stuff compared to what happens five years later. Five years later, we have the, the governor of Missouri, Lilburn W. Boggs, who issues an extermination order. And quite frank, frankly, in, in fairness to him, I think he didn't want to just go around and trying to kill Mormons, but rather he was saying, look it, uh, if you don't remove peaceably, we're going to have to do something else. But I don't think he was trying, you know, to, to, um, to take out as many Latter-day Saints as he, as he could. But this is what's happening. There's a lot of misunderstanding today. You know, I think we're getting better at this. I hope we are. I, you know, I love the, uh, the idea of seeking to understand before we seek to be understood. You know, trying to understand the other person's perspective. This is what it's all about. Trying to look for the, the common ground instead of the battleground. But this is the background of what's cooking here. So what happens is that Latter-day Saints by the thousands, about 10,000, they're going to leave Western Missouri, right? Go East. And they're going to go into the area for the most part in Quincy, Illinois. And eventually, they're going to migrate a little bit north to an area called Comrus that's later called Navu, which is a Hebrew word, which means beautiful. So some of the saints are saying to their leader, Joseph Smith, I mean, Joseph, this place is like a mud pit. You know, there's mosquitoes, there's swamps. And he says, look, it, we'll just drain it and we'll call it Navu, meaning a beautiful place. So that was the idea. But what happens here is when they're driven out, it's, it's, it's during this frigid season. It always seems to be winter when the saints were moving. And it recreated that frigid season with bitter feelings. And uh, this resentment you're going to see carries on into Salt Lake. And they're a little bit more, uh, I think, comfortable talking about uh, what happened in Missouri once they were on safe turf, quite frankly. So... There's a number of them had a very difficult time. There's 678 petitions we know of that are filed with the federal government. And uh, the president of the United States at the time in 38 says your cause is just, but I can do nothing for you because of the issue of states' rights, you know, and didn't want to lose the vote. So we have these kinds of issues that are going on. But what I want to talk about today, I'm dribbling the ball. Now we're going Stockton Malone, slam dunking. Here's the focus. I want to talk about, well, what happened after the extermination order between the time of 38 and 68? Because remember, the Transcontinental Railroad comes in in 69, right? So what happens? And I might also say that people that study pioneer history, they seem to have this um, issue. It's kind of a cultural myopia where they're always thinking about the trail, the trail, the trail. They don't think about the sail and the rail, right? They're just focused on this. And so hopefully today you can see uh, kind of a different aspect of migration west, immigration west, and, um, and, and see what's cooking here in the, what we refer to now as the show me state. So, and I want to also say that my family's lived in Missouri. I used to be a visiting professor at UMSL out in St. Louis. And really the, the western side and the eastern side in this time period was really quite different. We say the extermination order in the, you know, in all of Missouri, when in actuality there are newspapers saying that Boggs is, you know, what, what the heck is he doing, right? This is, so it was an oasis in St. Louis at the time, okay, rather than it being a hotbed as it was in western Missouri. But let's just get into this. And by the way, the most important part 
is that last five minutes, and when Mike brings up the mics here and it's my sign, okay, I got five minutes before Q&A, I wanna drive it home that even though things were looking rather bleak, right, in the early period, that things have really changed in the last 50 years, which is awesome. So here we go. So what did Latter-day Saints experience when they passed through Missouri, okay? so. This is, um, you know, you might be wondering. I mean, it was a two-sided thing. They weren't, you know, uh, these are people that have strong feelings towards each other. Those are, those are tough things to deal, deal with, and we have to kind of, we got to listen to the other person. I want to go back to the idea that as you, if you picture, so they're driven from western Missouri, clear across the state, about 200 miles, so they're going into that area, <clears throat> if you picture Quincy, north of St. Louis. And then they go into this little area that they call Nauvoo. Now, in this area, this is actually a daguerreotype from 1845, okay? So we get, uh, we, what's nice about the Nauvoo period is the first time that we have Latter-day Saint history in photographs because Louis Dagour, this Frenchman that invents this photography, the daguerreotype, once we get here, and they came in 39, right? Now we have actual photographs of what is cooking in these Latter-day Saint communities. So this is an important time period. And that building right there is really important. That is the Latter-day Saint temple, okay? I'll come back, I'll end on temples at the end of this thing. But this is the outhouse picture. We're here, this is the, uh, the river here, looking up, and uh, so, um, this will become a magnet for Latter-day Saints coming from the British Isles. So about one out of every four Latter-day Saints in the Nauvoo period were from England. They'd sent missionaries over, all right? And they came from Liverpool, up the Mississippi, across the Atlantic, up the Mississippi, through St. Louis and on their way to Nauvoo. And so <clears throat> we have this interesting history, and I should tell you this too. Latter-day Saints, felt obligated to record their experience of what they said was like going to Zion, just like for a Jew would be coming to Jerusalem, the Aliyah, the ascending. So I would say this, along with this Missouri family uh, room here, in Salt Lake City, they have what's called the Church History Library. And even if you're Catholic, Jewish, Protestant, agnostic, atheist, whatever, there's hundreds and thousands of first-person immigrant accounts describing what it was like to go through America in the mid-19th century. I mean, this is really interesting stuff with a lot of, you know, people that were fresh converts, and it's like, what was it like to experience this or that? And so I love it, and I share with my, um, my historian friends of different cultures and faith that this is, you, you gotta, you've got to at least take a look at this. You've got to look at everything, right? So here we go. So these, uh, these, uh, Latter-day Saint converts coming from the British Isles. They're coming, as I said, from um, Liverpool into New Orleans and just kind of making their way up here. You can see Nauvoo. And, um, you know, I don't know if you remember the, the movie. Do you remember Dead Poet Society, Robin Williams, where he says, seize the day? You know, the stories they had to tell, you know, leaving your... Um, <clears throat> your homeland, you're joining in a different faith. I have four different faiths in my own family alone. Seventh-day Adventist, Church of Christ, Evangelical Baptist, and Latter-day Saint me. But this was really emotional trauma when uh, somebody joined the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, made that leap in the adjustments of leaving homeland, family. These were real things, real things. And there were some feelings about Missouri. This is one of the famous Latter-day Saint uh, leaders, Parley, uh, Parker Pratt. And uh, so he's talking about how he landed uh, with my family, 80 miles below St. Louis. The company continued on. My reason for landing there was I would not venture into Missouri after the abuses I'd experienced there in former times. Now, as I go through all these things, keep in mind that I'm fully aware that there's two sides to every story, right? But this, I'm just gonna give you now from the, that Latter-day Saint perspective of what they're thinking about these things. Thomas Wrigley, we for some time felt afraid of the extermination orders of Governor Boggs, which were still 
in force, okay? So this is five years after the extermination order. Stan Kimball, who is a great uh, historian from Edwardsville, um, he notes at the time of the extermination order, several St. Louis newspapers condemned Governor Boggs and supported the saints. Some of the local St. Louis citizens even held meetings for the purpose of raising funds to assess uh, the Latter-day Saints in their dire condition. So uh, a different story there. And in Quincy, you know, it, it's right at the time they're coming across where there's been, you know, 800 banks have collapsed in America. It was a financial panic kind of a deal. They wanted someone to boost the uh, political side of things, so economics, politics, and really humanitarian appeal. They just felt sorry for them. So this was big, big business in the, uh, the mid-19th century. Uh, coming through St. Louis, the steamboat business, you know, you're, you're traveling about six days across this, uh, the state in a steamboat and uh, 207 miles on the Hannibal and St. Joe Railroad, right? So a little faster. But um, so we have these different accounts. I don't know if you're aware of this, but somewhere between 3,000 to 4,000 Latter-day Saints were in St. Louis uh, during this period of the early 50s. And there was an immigration agent here, a church leader, Nathaniel Felt. And it's interesting, the, the, the Latter-day Saints even had their own newspaper, the St. Louis Luminary, okay? Now, because of polygamy, these Latter-day Saint newspapers were launched in the 50s. So in 1852, from Salt Lake City, it came out, yes, we do practice polygamy just like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? So the message just, boom, came out there. And then all of a sudden, you see the Western uh, Standard newspaper of the Latter-day Saints in San Francisco. You've got the Mormon in New York. You've got the St. Louis Luminary. And even as far as Sydney, Australia, you've got Zion's Watchmen. So they have these things in place to defend their doctrine of polygamy, for example, as a biblical doctrine, and also to teach the immigration, the gathering to Zion, as they called it, okay? So you had these newspapers. St. Louis is a fine, large, and flourishing city and has furnished employment to many hundreds and thousands of our brethren. Here's another misnomer. For Latter-day Saints that do, like, use family search, and, and I, I have the Saints by Sea website that Jeremy talked about, um, anyway, a lot of different things. People think that mom and dad and the kids all came together. They left from wherever, Liverpool, and then they went to Salt Lake. They don't realize that sometimes they were stuck in Boston, Philadelphia, New York, St. Louis, New Orleans, for months and sometimes years, trying to raise enough money to be able to continue the journey once they cross the Atlantic. Does that make sense? So this is this idea of having jobs. And then the missionaries be looking, okay, we need, uh, they'd, have, they'd send the passenger list ahead of time. And it's like, okay, we need eight miners over here. We can use someone, you know, wh wh whatever vocation. They're, they're just, they're setting things up to try to help them. But the idea at this time was it was a temporary location to make it to Salt Lake. <clears throat> Once the city of the saints is firmly established, then it becomes out-migration. And Latter-day Saints in the mid-20th century start coming out to the St. Louis area, Kansas City area, those kinds of things, largely because of employment. Now, you're, you're, I know you're, many of you, probably all of you are familiar with the Missouri Republican. So I think this is interesting what they have to say about Latter-day Saints, Okay. Our city is the greatest recruiting point for Mormon immigrants from England and the eastern states, whose funds generally become exhausted by the time they reach here. Very thing I was talking about. They stop for several months and not infrequently remain here for a year or two pending the resumption of their journeys to Salt Lake. There are at this time in St. Louis about 3,000 English Mormons, nearly all of whom are masters of some trade. So this was actually a good gig for everybody. This was synergistic. This was win-win, right? So I'm trying to contrast what was going on in Western Missouri with what's going on. And incidentally, this is 15 years since the extermination order, right? So we just kind of keep those things in mind. What about the Northwest? I know one of the, uh, our um, um, people visiting today mentioned they were from the Northwest. This is interesting because as you look at the Mormon trail here, see, so they're going to leave. They're also driven from Nauvoo, Illinois. 
and 46. They crossed Iowa, and uh, this was, it took them longer to go this distance than this distance because of the mud and when they left. And then you can just see how it, 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 it's weaving its way to various areas. But here in winter quarters, where you see this northwestern corner, there were people that were traveling down trying to get jobs, uh, working to be able to have uh, funds to continue on in the jury uh, journey. So this is my, one of my colleagues, Richard E. Bennett, saying the bluffs were far enough away, council bluffs they called it, Omaha, Nebraska area, so as not to provoke trouble, yet close enough to permit trade and arm's length. The elements of trade between Missouri and Mormons must be seen on at least two levels. First, aggregate and corporate purchases for the church, and second, individual trade, yeah? Many Teamsters hired themselves out as laborers for nearby farmers, building fences, etc. Some in more disparate straits traveled disguised and incognito among northern Missouri farm sites and villages to find interim employment. So my colleague, Professor Bennett, maintains that from 46 to 50, Missouri became the lifeline to the Mormon exodus. Had it not been for this Missouri trade and employment, most would not have had gathered sufficient means to migrate to the Valley of the Great Salt Lake. So this is, I, I think, this whole idea of being a, an economic uh, salvation. So I'm giving you snapshots, right? I'm giving you West Missouri. I'm giving you St. Louis. I'm giving you now Northwestern, you know, St. Joe area up here. Uh, kind of a feel of what's, what's happening here at the time. And I thought this was an interesting, uh, this is the, uh, the year that Brigham Young comes into the Salt Lake Valley, that Vanguard company in 47, Hosea Stout, who kept a meticulous journal. He said, the most opposition we have in Missouri, right? This is uh, about a decade after extermination was, uh, in consequence of the stories of the dissenters. Otherwise, the Missourians are very friendly. So some left the church but couldn't leave it alone, all right? So this is reality taking snapshots. Now, this gets a little bit more colorful, and there's some language here. I kind of toned it down, but... Uh, so when they get into Salt Lake, as I mentioned, people are more relaxed, I think, to really share how they felt. And there was some, there was some uh, difficult things that happened to uh, men, women, and children in Missouri before they left, and... So <clears throat> what I did is I went out to the Bancroft Library. They have a rich collection. The great collections for immigration, the Western migration. Uh, so you have the, the, the co-library at uh, Yale. You have Bancroft at UC Berkeley. You have the private collection in the Huntington Library. And you, you find these accounts particularly during the California Gold Rush. 49 and 50 are like peak years where people are traveling through and some people from Missouri, they do not want to go through Salt Lake City because they know the history, right? And they don't want to risk it. And uh, <clears throat> so where you see here is we have this Aylet Cotton who says, I was told that he, meaning Brigham Young, said that these were people coming and skulking through the place on the way to California who had taken part in driving them out of Missouri. And if he could catch them, he would send them to hell across lots. There were some Missourians who became alarmed and started on as soon as possible. In reality, the people that went through Salt Lake City in the mid-19th century stayed for six and a half days. If you take every journal, you do a little bit of statistical analysis, six and a half days. Now, <clears throat> most of them wanted to get their supplies and go on to California, but there actually were a, a few converts that were looking for something they felt was more valuable than gold. <clears throat> so as I said, after arriving in Salt Lake Valley, there seems to exist a certain security that some of the saints took advantage of when vocalizing their deep-seated feelings concerning their poor treatment in western Missouri in the 1830s. For example, in 49, James Humphreys of Hannibal, Missouri said, having some fear of going through Salt Lake on account of the old feelings they, the Mormons, notice the spelling, had against the Missourians, we concluded to take Sublet's cut off. Bancroft Library. Or another westbound immigrant wrote, arrived in Great Salt Lake City, July 19th, 1849. I was riding along the street and I spoke to an aged man. Well, says he, we're glad you're here. 
if you did not drive us out of Missouri, which was all Greek to me as I knew nothing of Mormons or their history. So you get, this is something when you see these accounts, you get the idea that something that happened back in the 30s is still festering a decade or more later, right? I mean, this is what's cooking. So Isaac Julian Harvey said, I went north of Salt Lake City as the Mormons were down on the Missourians. Generally, many Missouri trains got in trouble. If their stock got into the gardens of, or any fields, they were fined heavily. It was charged that the Mormons would turn the cattle in on purpose to make trouble. I knew many immigrants that were ruined and had to work their way to Oregon or California. Now, that might very well be true because I know that not all saints wear halos, personally, okay? This is, uh, but these are some of the things that are, that are going on. Now, this one is a little bit, I, I debated whether or not to pull this one or not, uh, but I thought, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it in there. So here you have the Mormons this day celebrate the arrival of the first settlement of this valley three years ago by then. Remember Brigham Young and the Vanguard Company come in 47 by 1850. We are in a, a hearing of their canons by way of jollification. The, the Mormons cursed the, the darn ragged immigrant SOBs from Missouri and Illinois. Remember these are two places are cast out in Nauvoo, um, traveling through their country. So. I simply share these accounts to share with you the feelings are still bitter, okay? Now, let me introduce you to these frontier outfitting posts. So they're coming from across the Atlantic Ocean. They're coming from the East Coast. They're coming from the South. And they have these different frontier outfitting posts, which here we have winter quarters, as I told you, this is Omaha, Nebraska. Kaysville, Iowa, just right across the way. You can see the years. And like here, they had the Frontier Guardian. They had another newspaper where you can mine these first-person accounts. Keokuk, Iowa, this is interesting because there was a terrible steamboat explosion I'm going to tell you about in Lexington on the border of Jackson County, right? It's about 45 minutes from here. And so Keokuk, they tried. Keokuk, Iowa is like a dozen miles south of Nauvoo. They tried that, but they just didn't like <clears throat> the extra distance. So they went back uh, to Westport here in this area. Then they're rotating Mormon Grove, Iowa City. Now we have the um, Castle Garden Immigration Depot and um, in New York City. They're going to take trains out to Iowa City. This is where the handcart companies come in. 1856 to 1860, we have 10 handcart companies totaling about 3,000 Latter-day Saints. They usually get the most news, even though only about 3% of the migration, because people were fascinated with hand cards. <clears throat> and then you keep uh, Florence, Nebraska. Wyoming, Nebraska is 45 miles south. Um, they actually, this is an interesting one, they actually moved from Florence to Wyoming, Nebraska, because the word they use is apostate, the, the church, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints that had left the church. Uh, again, uh, apostasy is a Greek word meaning mutiny from within. They're, they're, they've, they've left the fold. One journal I read said that there were more apostates in Florence, Nebraska, that, it was th that they were thicker than the lice of Egypt in the days of Pharaoh. So they moved it 45 miles south so that the fresh converts coming from England weren't always going to be, you know, let me tell you what it's really like, right? And, and so it was, uh, it was a strategy. So we move into the railroad towns later, but I want to say something about the Mississippi and the Missouri River. I'm a real fan of the Arabia Steamboat Museum. How many of you have been to the Arabia Steamboat Museum? Okay, if you haven't been there and you love history, this is an absolute must. This was uh, the steamboat um, Arabia um, went down in 1856 and they have 200 tons of treasure there. Uh, things like pickles and shoes and rakes and things going out to market, but it, it's something and it's something to behold. I wanna quote Father Pierre de Schmidt who said, steam navigation on the Big Muddy or Missouri is one of the most dangerous things a man can undertake. I fear the sea, but all the storms and other unpleasant things I've experienced in four different ocean voyages did it not inspire me with so much terror as the navigation of this somber, treacherous, muddy 
Missouri. So it was a different ball game here. Now, what are some of the risks, disease? In fact, Brigham Young sent an, a letter out. They changed immigration in 1855 to not come up in Mississippi, right? To go to Boston, Philadelphia, New York, and you had the, uh, the pre-Ellis Island at the, in, in New York, the Castle Garden, because they were losing too many people, a lot to yellow fever and, and uh, cholera. Now, along these things, you folks are Midwest, Missouri folks, you understand these things, but boiler, uh, bo boiler explosions, I want, to, I want to say something about quickly. Here's Lexington, okay? So they're coming here, <clears throat> they're coming into uh, picking up the, the journey here in the early 50s, and they're on their way heading towards Kansas City. Anyway, long story short, this captain was trying to come around the river and he just put too much steam on. In fact, uh, a stave tied with a dog went 600 yards blown in the air, you know, the distance of a football, six football fields. I mean, it was incredible. So this happened April 9th, 1852, and about two dozen Latter-day Saints were killed, among others. But the Lexington citizens were heroic. I mean, they raised money to uh, bury the dead instead of finishing them off. Remember, the extermination order is still in effect. And they took in some orphan children, uh, they, they, so, uh, and along with raising the money to bury the dead, money to send them on to the Salt Lake Valley. So there was truly compassion that was shown. And I see this as kind of a, a turning point in some ways that later would be built upon in order to build bridges with, between Latter-day Saints and the Missouri uh, neighbors in years to come. Here's a picture of H.H. H. Gratz, who was one of those citizens who helped to raise money. Um, Abraham O. Smoot, we have a Smoot building on BYU campus. He said, I'll never forget the kindness of the citizens of Lexington in caring for the living and burying the dead. Prominent citizens did all they could to comfort and help the afflicted survivors. Well, this is a whole different ball game now, right? We're going from extermination to compassion. And uh, this, was, this was a great thing. I had the opportunity, I look a little younger here 20 years ago. And uh, here I am with my sweetheart is here today. And, and uh, Mike Hutchings, my good friend with the Mormon Historic Sites Foundation and others, Mayor Tom Hayes. When this thing was over, he said, Fred, I want you to come down and meet my friends. He took me down to the Baptist church. And did any of you know Tom Hayes, any, Mayor Hayes? Yeah, he, I think Annie got a key to the city and, and I did too. But anyway, it was, it was a wonderful thing of bridge building, healing wounds, and we had this, it's still there, the Memorial Park, and um, that's still there. And, and I ended up doing a, a book with uh, William Hartley. I came to tell you the truth. I was supposed to teach a course, a graduate course at UMSOL on um, Mormon migration, it was called. Well, I need to find a story that was, again, generating more light than heat, okay? And I came upon the Saluda story, and I thought, oh my word, I gotta do a documentary film on this, I gotta do a book. This is great stuff because it was moving forward rather than talking about, uh, you know, those people from the past that did these rotten things. It was showing healing, compassion, helping. This is the history I enjoy telling. When it turns, when we, when we, when we think of the other, right? So I did this film. Some of you know uh, Jack Cashel. He was involved with this. Jack is the one that did the Arabia Steamboat introductory film, <clears throat> a great guy. And get this, all these reenactors, Civil War enactors, they didn't want to take a penny. They just said, we, we love this story. We're here. Use us any way you want. These are, these, so these, none of these folks were Latter-day Saints. And then we have, actually in our audience today, I didn't know if she'd be here, this gal, Annie Hamrick, Hamrick she could give you her old story. She started bringing uh, youth groups, uh, young women out, and they started doing all these projects. And uh, so they did far more than I ever uh, started. But look at this, Lexington Library, over 450 books were donated, serving at the hospital with donations, high schools, the cemetery, the Civil War battlefield. I don't have time to read all this, but <clears throat> this is good stuff that was going on, trying to turn the tide <clears throat> and trying to to promote goodwill. Now, before I do the epilogue, I've got to say something about the trains. So 
Here you have the Hannibal and St. Joe, 207 miles. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. This is an interesting story, my friends. So you had, Brigham Young was brilliant with colonization and immigration, and he had different agents. And George Q. Cannon says, you know what, let's, let's do a new route. Let's go from Hannibal and St. Joe again, 20 years after the extermination order. And you have these newspapers. I'm giving you one. There are scores and scores and scores and scores. And they are quite different, the papers that uh, are going on in, on the Illinois side of the river and those coming into Hannibal. But you get these kind of derogatory things uh, that are going on, but they didn't mind taking their cash. And, uh, you know, there's, it's just how it is. But this period during the Civil War, I mean, I've studied Latter-day Saint immigration since the 90s. And my favorite time period is the Civil War. I mean, this is high adventure in so many ways. So you can kind of see that the primary route of where they're heading here. And uh, you, you get these wonderful first-person accounts of, you know, this is 64. So Civil War 61 to 65, just reminding us, taking steamers. Sometime they would, they would actually go into Canada briefly and come back out and, you know, and Windsor. And, but, you know, it, it gives you this description of what's going on um, at the time. And the Confederacy always wanted to get the General McClellan, named after a, a Union uh, officer. And so sometimes they'd cross the Atlantic, and you'd have one of these Southern boys with a stogie, and he'd say something like this. You better say your prayers moments, because you're going down. You're going down. We have first-person accounts of British Latter-day Saint converts crossing the Atlantic and these kinds of comments, but they didn't want to, you know, have uh, more repercussions in the Civil War, but incredible. If I had 1.5 million, if Jeremy could raise some funding for me or something, I could do this film. So anyway, <laughs> or maybe that's a Joel question. Anyway, I'm, I'm kidding, of course, but. Anyway, so you get this war zone, and where, where you see, I mean, I have many, many first-person accounts, again, because people that made the journey kept a journal. Keep a journal, friends. <laughs> Keep a journal. Houses burned, fences destroyed, bridges guarded by Union troops. Um, anyway, this is, this is interesting stuff. We had to change into a train of cattle cars, and the car I got in was a car that hogs had been shipped in. But see, it was so much safer to go in the cattle cars because if you were in the nicer cars with the Union soldiers, that's where the guerrilla warfare is going. The Confederacy is shooting cannonballs over their head, right? So they're, they're riding where the animals usually went, which was actually safer even though it was stinky. So you have these, you're going to see this over and over again of, uh, of what's cooking as they're traveling on the Hannibal and uh, St. Saint, uh, Saint Joe Railroad in these first-person accounts. They said they were afraid of the good cars being burned by the Confederates, right? So they're, they're taking this route. <clears throat> I found this, excuse me, <clears throat> image over in the California Museum of... Um, I remember, but it's rare to be able to find a photo like this. And, and here we have this, this idea of this hotbed uh, guerrilla warfare as they're traveling. Andrew Jensen, who became the assistant church historian for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, said, a very disagreeable ride through the state of Missouri where the inhabitants at nearby, where, where the inhabitants at, nearby, at nearly every station did all they could to insult the, the immigrants. Well, this is at the time of the Civil War, so this isn't like saying that everybody is uh, from Missouri, right? But you can kind of read between the lines of what's happening here. They said they were wait afraid of their good cars being burned by the Confederates. We took a steamer up the Missouri. It was a flat boat, and we were very crowded. So you get rough travel not only on the river, but again on the rail. Joseph W. Young wrote, every few miles, the debris of a wrecked train and and surmise the situation by stating, were not that God is with his people, the thought of the saints traveling over such a road would be almost unbearable. And so <clears throat> what, another thing you should understand 
is that in the journals during this time period, Latter-day Saints felt like they were modern-day Israel, and Brigham Young was an American Moses. So there's that. That's in, their, that's in the journals. That's in their thoughts, and this idea that God will watch over us if we simply gather, if we gather to Zion. So Salt Lake was considered Zion, just like for the Jews, Jerusalem is Zion, and Zion is Jerusalem. We passed the soldiers' camp, and it was here we ran into a place where logs had been placed to disrail the cars. You're going to see this a lot over and over again. At St. Joe, <clears throat> we have the uh, bushwhackers fire two cannonballs through our train. One shot went through the passenger car exactly eight inches above the people's heads, and the other through the baggage car, destroying a great amount of baggage. Sounds of uh, cannons. Uh, when we passed through Missouri, the people were very bitter against the Mormons and set a bridge on fire to retard our, our progress. Well, we don't know for sure if that was the Missourians or whatever, but this, again, is the feeling that's going on. One wrote, after uh, experiencing all this stuff, we stayed in St. Joe three or four days, afraid to go on because of the rebel soldiers being all through the country. I can truly say I saw a little of the war between the North and the South. William Freshwater. You also have accounts in St. Joe, Missouri in 63. I love this. This is, you know, the Gettysburg uh, uh, battle period. The soldiers would get $1 for each man or boy they would get a pin or ribbon on. If the ribbon was pinned on the man, he was counted as, an, as in the army. His word was out of the question. No one would believe him. He also reported that one girl was taken by the soldiers from their company. During this period, Latter-day Saints feared the soldiers more than Native Americans, okay? as they went across the plains uh, in the mid-19th century. So, um, so as a conclusion to this part, and then I want to do a quick epilogue for a, a few minutes. During the three decades which followed the extermination decree issued in 1838, there appears to be no evidence of Missouri enforcing extermination order. So that's important, I think. <clears throat> the other is, however, Latter-day Saint immigrants did face a number of enemies or adversities in a different kind. Obstacles of the threat of disease, boiler explosions, danger resulting from military conflict, some insults and abundance of bad press. However, in the border cities of St. Louis, Westport, and St. Uh, Joe, Missouri, the Latter-day Saints were able to develop relationships, gain employment, and make useful trades. By the time the Transcontinental Railroad had crossed America in the spring of 1869, the Saints no longer needed to cross Missouri to get to the Salt Lake Valley, right? A century later, an abundance of effort to build good relationships with various communities commenced as Latter-day Saints left Utah to establish families in other states, including Missouri. Hearts were turned towards uh, moving from conflict understanding. So five-minute epilogue. I know that's my five-minute point, so we're, we're doing okay. Let me just say this. <clears throat> I appreciate various people in this community that have been involved in public affairs. I said, you know what? What's going on now? What's happened with this extermination order? And I've been really uh, interested in this one when Governor Christopher S. Bond, as part of this, the spirit of the bicentennial, rescinded the extermination order. You're thinking, you've got to be kidding me. No, I'm not kidding. It was not rescinded until 1976, although there wasn't anything. I mean, after they're driven out in 38, people aren't, you know, hunting for Latter-day Saints in the state of Missouri, okay? So it was rescinded in 1976 and good for Governor Bond. Another thing I learned was that the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, now called the Community of Christ, they were actually in 1975 saying, you know, it'd be a really nice thing if you could, you know, help with the rescinding this extermination order. And then later, the Latter-day Saints played a key role in this which story I'm not going to tell right now. I'm writing an article with Professor Alex, uh, Alex Baugh on this, the, the whole fleshed out story. I've, I've been in contact with people that have been in public affairs at Latter-day Saints, like Judy Ricks, who's talked about she was doing these uh, wonderful things from 94 to 2012. And I said, give me some activities. Well, she talked about being in partnership with the community of Christ, doing different things with you know, uh, musical groups, speakers, bureaus, joining coalitions for positive family relationships, media workshops, a service above and beyond awards, better together community church concerts and things. 
And I got a little of that also from Don and, and Carol Deschler, who have been in this area for 50 years and have done public affairs work and, and served in other ecclesiastical assignments and just jointly trying to um, promote service and community goodness. And I've really appreciated their help. A few examples they've mentioned from the community support Latter-day Saints, land purchasing, right? When someone said, you know, Latter-day Saints are buying too much, this or that. There might be someone who steps to the plate like John Dillingham and says, hey, you know, let's, let's have uh, one of your senior uh, church leaders come out and just explain what you're doing this for, right? So really uh, causing tensions to be eased or invitation to serve on board of community outreach networks have gone on or invitation extended to be a member of the Kansas City Mayor's Prayer Breakfast. These little things, out of small and simple things, proceed that which is great. Being involved with the Boy Scouts of America has been a huge thing as far as trying to uh, pa pass out that olive leaf. So 70s and 80s, you get the rescinding the extermination order. We also have in the 80s, Latter-day Saint uh, presidents, uh, ecclesiastical, they call it a stake, like a diocese uh, or... or or Latter-day Saint presence of the visitor centers, working in, 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 in connection with other groups, being involved, trying to move from the, uh, them against us to from, move from being, as the Deschlers say, apart from to being a part of, being a community, trying to weave things together. Uh, late in the 80s, on LDS uh, presence of the visitor centers, or directors, I should say, and the Missouri Independence Mission got immersed in developing relationships with opinion leaders. Again, move from, apart from, to being a part of. The 90s, you have this public affairs as joining in with community service, cultivating relationships, initiating various awards as Judy talked about. The Mormon Tabernacle Choir, now called the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square, they came several times this area. That really created good, well, you know how music is the universal language and people think like, you know, these folks seem like they're, they're, they're decent people. And, um, and so in the last 20 years, again, you get this better together choir, good, good uh, um, journalism from the KC Star. And then the Kansas, I was really interested in the Kansas City, uh, Missouri Temple because I have a daughter that lives in this area. And I'm like, what happened in the last, because it was dedicated a decade ago and it's really interesting to me, you never see this where there's only one protester. I mean, think about the background. One protester, that's unusual. Large turnout, dozens of opinion leaders coming. The, the apology on the extermination order again. And the motif of the temple, I think is interesting, the olive leaf, right? The olive leaf. So dedicated in May 6th of 2012 by then President Thomas S. Monson of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I love when he gave the dedicatory prayer that he made the point that the church shines forth in the sunlight of goodwill uh, because of the people in this community that allowed this to take place. So anyway, the sin of ingratitude is a crime more despicable than revenge. So I had to put up a few sources, but thank you for listening to me and we'll turn it over to Q&A. How's that sound? Okay, anyway, thank you. Okay, so I'm about two minutes over. Sorry oh, about that, Jeremy. You're great. So it, uh, if any audience member has a question, we ask that you go to one of the microphones. And if uh, someone from our uh, online, uh, watching online has a question, they can, uh, th that will be relayed to me. But I, I will start off. So you laid out in the early uh, 1830s the, the mob manifesto, the grievances yes. of, of, of locals against... Uh, the Mormon settlers, um, and then five years later, there's an extermination order. Uh, was this a um, escalating resentment over a few years and hatred, or was there a specific a specific event that, that really triggered the this this order by uh, Governor Boggs? That's that's a good question. So I think it's really a combination of. Um, of both, but after a while, uh, the Latter-day Saints, um, so they're driven out of Jackson County. Alexander Donovan, you probably know this name from history, he was a real um, asset for Latter-day Saints. He wasn't a Latter-day Saint, but he was an attorney, and uh, so he was staking out lands for Davies and Caldwell Counties. One was for non-Latter-day Saints, one was for Latter-day Saints, 
And uh, they're just, I, I think all the way along, there was a feeling like this isn't going to work because, again, it was a cultural conflict where you're trying to mix oil and water. And so these things of um, Latter-day Saints had what was called what you'd find in the New Testament of all things common, which they called the law of consecration, where they'd want to pool their economic resources just insular, and that didn't help the economy for everybody else. And you had issues of politics, as I mentioned. So things are escalating. And then there was what's called the Battle of Crooked River that takes place in October of 38. That's a bit of a problem. Uh, you had people, uh, a few killed on each side. And then you had the Hans Mo massacre. I didn't mention which 17 Latter-day Saints were killed. And so anyway, it was when, they, when the Latter-day Saints, I think, decided to kind of step it up uh, as far as a defense. Uh, this is when um, things really escalated. And, and uh, to, you know, Governor Boggs, I think, just wanted to remove the problem. Again, I don't think he was going out trying to see how many Mormons he could kill, but rather just kind of, it, it just wasn't working. I mean, um, sometimes there's marriages, we want them to work, but sometimes we know it isn't going to work, right? And so we had this conflict. So what's the next question? Thanks. Well, yeah, we have some uh, coming in. One was a comment. Someone mentioned that they, uh, they, are, they are from Keokuk. Am I pronouncing that right, Iowa? Keokuk. Ke Keokuk, yeah. Keokuk Iowa. Yes. Uh, their family had um, uh, escaped, escaped southern slavery to, 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 to settle there. Um, another question had to do with, uh, uh, you mentioned uh, sympathizers, uh, uh, um, St. Louis newspapers that, yeah. that sympathized um, with, with the Mormons. Were there, were there any sympathetic parties or vocal sympathetic parties on the western side of the state, or were things just so bad that uh, there really there uh, there really were no no vo at least vocal sympathizers on on this part of the state in Jackson County and in the, in the nearby counties? Yeah, I'm thinking of the Journal of Albert Rockwood, who wrote in 1838, speaking of West Missouri. But it, it seemed like the devil was in every man in Missouri. Now, he's talking about Western. Now, of course, a decade later, Hosea Stout, as I read, is saying, hey, it was the dissenters causing his problems. And, you know, these folks were friendly. So I think there definitely were sympathizers on the West side. But it, it took a few years to calm down the tension of what was happening at the time. But, you know, when I'm giving you a general, uh, just to, to the public here, we're getting a general uh, sketch of things, right? There's always somebody that is, I mean, Donovan, Alexander Donovan, um, just reviewing, this is an important point, I think. So uh, Joseph Smith spent some time in Liberty Jail, not long, far from here. And uh, he was sentenced to be shot um, at the end of October of 1838. Alexander Donovan stood up to his commanding officer and said, if you carry this out, I will hold you responsible before an earthly tribunal. So help me God. So Donovan to me is like one Donovan is worth a thousand others. But here's an example of someone that had incredible integrity. And, uh, you know, and as I said, they're not all saints wear halos. There's and there's two sides of the issue here. The Latter-day Saints did a number of things they shouldn't have done that just kind of poked at the local citizens. So I hope that that comes across that it wasn't just one-sided. Sure, and that's a great segue to another question we had just come in. Uh, if you had been church leader during that, that period, that time of conflict, uh, what would you have done uh, differently? Well, it's really interesting that uh, as I've reflected on this, I've thought of, so Latter-day Saints, um, they, have, they believe in the Bible, and they also believe in different books of Scripture. So they believe that God was speaking in the, at this time period. And it's interesting to me that in what, of what, they, what would be referred to by Latter-day Saints as a revelation, uh, that, that the Lord would say this, now think about what we've been talking about in the 30s. Let all my people who dwell in the regions round about be very faithful and prayerful and humble before me and reveal not the things which I revealed unto them until it is wisdom in me that they should be revealed. 
Talk not of judgments, neither boast of faith and of mighty works, but carefully gather together as much in one region as can be consistently with the feelings of the people. In other words, don't gather in haste. And behold, so the idea of Latter-day Saints, and I think, thought uh, that if they did this, it says, I will give unto you favor and grace in their eyes that you may rest in peace and safety. I think if that counsel would have been followed to uh, be thinking more about the other, to be a gathering, you know, not in haste, um, and doing some of these things just, uh, and I think that's what we see the last 50 years. It's that we're a community. We work together. It's, it's not them and us. It's, um, it's looking for the common ground instead of the battleground. It's, it's, I love the Latin maxim, in the essentials, let there be unity. Non-essentials, liberty, but in all things, charity. And I think that attitude you see later with maturity. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I always think of this. It's interesting to ask that question, and it, I was reading it this morning. <laughs> A, uh, another online viewer uh, wanted clarification. Uh, were there any saints uh, killed during the extermination order? Were there documented killings that took place um, after that order was issued? Yeah, so the extermination order is October 27, 1838. So um, you have the Hansville massacre, but that isn't really, that's going on outside of this, I think, getting circulated everywhere. I think really, uh, really the expert on this is Alexander L. Baugh, professor at BYU. And he would probably, um, you know, as far as documenting two deaths, there were, there were some other things, atrocities that went on, there were cases of property and all that. But we're not talking about 2,200, you know, two score, but really as far as death. And I think that again shows that the idea was let's remove the problem but not looking for an, uh, an opportunity to, to shoot a, a dozen bullets through somebody. It was just a culture conflict. As, as the, the saints left Jackson County and, and, and fled, uh, and fled uh, east, was there, uh, was, it's my understanding there was some violence at the time as they were, as they yeah. were leaving, but I, I assumed as they got further east that yeah. uh, there was less in, instances of that? Yeah, and, and West. I mean, they're getting out of this state is the right. bottom line. They're just getting beyond the borders of this modern-day Mesopotamia between the uh, Mississippi and the Missouri River. Well, I have a, one final question. What's your current uh, research project? Do you have a, a book <laughs> coming out or uh, yeah, so, so something you'd like to share with us? Yeah, I have... Um, over this next year, they're already at press, but I have a book on Latter-day Saints um, story in South Africa. I have another book on the Latter-day Saint image in the British mind that's coming out. And I just finished one that's being published by the University of Nevada Press. Um, it's called Bright Lights in the Desert, the Latter-day Saints of Las Vegas, showing how a very small uh, population of Latter-day Saints have helped to keep Pandora in the box or the strip influence on the strip through a lot of different ways. So, and then I'm doing a massive 10 year project called Saints by State. I did Saints by Sea for a quarter of a century. Now I'm doing Saints by State. And so I know, for example, in the state of Missouri, there's 931 published sources on Latter-day Saints in Missouri. So I'm going state by state doing published, unpublished. I'm doing documentary, um, I'm doing Zoom interviews, interviewing people, doing little short vignettes and uh, documentary uh, filming. I'm doing um, statistical analysis, maps, chronologies. I mean, I'm so ex excited about it that uh, eating and sleeping have become a burden. <laughs> Well, I, I want to thank you again. It is great to, Dr. Woods, have you here in person. Uh, we've all been used to Zoom and online programs. So I, you know, uh, it, it, there's something different about having these, being able to have these in person again. I want to thank our audience, uh, both here and online, and, um, and hope to have you back. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeremy. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much.